Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the Ethereum Community Fund announcement event today. I am Eriko Kaneko and I'll be your MC today. Today's event consists of two sessions. The first session consists of a keynote by the founder of Ethereum, Mr. Vitalik Buterin, and the executive director of the Ethereum Foundation, Ms. Aya Miyaguchi. Followed by the introduction of Ethereum Community Fund by Mr. Wendell Davis. After that, we also have a project introduction and finished with a photo session. The second session will be our Founders Panel. So please stay with us and enjoy the event. Now we will have Mr. Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, to give a keynote. Vitalik, please. talking a bit about the Ethereum community. Um, so the first question you might want to ask is, where is Ethereum? And the, ans well, the best answer really is, Ethereum is basically everywhere all around the world. Right? So this is a map of something like 15,000 Ethereum nodes that I talked about two days ago. And you can see that there's people participating in the Ethereum network from basically every continent. and uh, with uh, a lot of centers in North America, some in Europe, some in Asia. And there's people coming from you know, pretty much every part of the world that's uh, participating in the Ethereum network in some form. Um, if you look at meetup groups, you get something similar. You get a lot of meetups um, in you know, pretty much every part of the world that has people in it. Um, sorry, Antarctica. Sorry, Greenland. Um, so next question, who is Ethereum? I mean, so Ethereum is a you know, global worldwide community made up of people from you know, every part of the world, from many different kinds of backgrounds. And there's people who are, you know, fo are, are focused on doing different things, right? So first of all, there is kind of Ethereum core development and Ethereum core research, right? So trying, maintaining the Ethereum network, um, fixing, upgrading, um, maintaining the code that runs the Ethereum uh, clients that everyone uses to connect to the Ethereum network, coming up with uh, plans and implementing plans for future hard forks, working on Casper, working on sharding, working on Plasma, working on state channels. There's also uh, a lot of people who are working on uh, different kinds of infrastructure. So I already managed Ethereum clients. Um, there's also tools for developers, also tools for users, wallets, block explorers, and finally there's applications. And the, app the, the applications part is definitely by far the largest, right? There are some applications that are, in, uh, um, that are focused on um, individual users, there are some applications focused on enterprises, and like, just about every kind of um, application um, out there out there, right, and, you know, in the financial industry, for uh, currencies, for um, insurance, decentralized exchanges, identity, uh, certificate revocation, you know, like putting, putting a, a decentralized Twitter on the blockchain, just about everything out there. And like really these different layers do all, all, all depend on each other. If it weren't for the applications, no one would care about Ethereum and the Ethereum ecosystem would have no value. If it weren't for the developers, no one would be able to run a node and the Ethereum network would not exist. And if it weren't for the researchers, the ideas behind Ethereum would never have been uh, created in the first place. And the ideas that will bring Ethereum forward to be the kind of massively scalable and secure network that we want it to be would also not be able to come to a fruition. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about the Ethereum Foundation. So the purpose of the Ethereum Foundation is to uh, develop and grow the um, Ethereum protocol and um, Ethereum ecosystem, um, basically because we believe that Ethereum and things and decentralized and cool things on Ethereum can be good for humanity. Um, we um, particularly 
um, do this by uh, using our resources to fund and support basic infrastructure, and so including you know, Ethereum protocol implementations, including security auditing, including uh, support, supporting researchers, including supporting developers, development environments, and to fund support infrastructure as well as other public goods that would otherwise um, have difficulty getting funded. So it's particularly things that individual private companies do not see the incentive for themselves to give up a lot of money to fund. That is where the Ethereum Foundation can step in and uh, put its resources to make sure that much needed infrastructure can still be created and put into place. So Ethereum Foundation can uh, support, um, supports a very large group of people and it supports uh, people in different ways. Right, so the Ethereum Foundation has about 70 core contributors that are full-time, and we have some major offices in various places around the world. We also have people who just live by themselves, and we have at least like four or five people who just live full-time on airplanes. So um, outside of that, um, the Ethereum Foundation has been recently massively expanding the uh, scope of its grant program. And it's been, um, it recently announced uh, $2.5 million of grants to um, projects um, in the Ethereum ecosystem that are working on um, implementing uh, th uh, sharding, solving, uh, ver uh, and um, developing solutions to various Ethereum scaling challenges, um, doing formal verification for Casper, along with you know, v various other and of much needed tasks. And that was just around what in 2018. So we intend to you know, fully continue and even expand uh, the grant program uh, further in the near future. And even the grant program by itself, you know, like we, we do expect you know, like may well ultimately reach, uh, reach and support even more people than uh, the people the foundation keeps kind of internally full time. And finally, there is you know, like the much larger community and people who participate in development, participate in research, participate in building applications, and do all of these things without kind of direct and explicit support from the foundation. But at the same time, we still do things like supporting events, supporting conferences, documentation, uh, tutorials, in order to try to help people grow, help people make sure that people can have the information that they need and um, other things like that. Um, Ethereum Foundation is not the only major kind of body in the Ethereum ecosystem. There is also the Ethereum um, Enterprise Alliance, which uh, is um, a group of several hundred uh, large corporations and startups um, that's uh, building Ethereum applications specifically in the kind of institutional government enterprise space. And um, now there's uh, the Ethereum Community Fund being launched. Yay! Who here is excited about the Ethereum Community Fund? So who else is there, right? So uh, the Ethereum community is a, a decentralized one and we specifically try not to have it be the kind of environment where all of the ideas and all of the code is, is kind of built, you know, written and uh, sent down from on high from one particular foundation that just pays everyone and does everything. You know, we uh, try very hard to kind of cooperate with and support a lot of very strong outside talent. So like for example, there, um, on the core research side, there's people working on state channels, which is a, uh, another kind of uh, scalability and uh, latency reduction strategy for Ethereum. There's a company called L4 that's doing that. I think recently Spankchain made some, um, some uh, announcements about a uh, state channel implementation, and like Funfair did one. Um, Plasma, so outside of the Ethereum Foundation, Joseph Poon, yay, stand up wherever you are, or at least wave. Oh, it, I think he might be outside eating some vegan food. Uh, good for him. <laughs> um, uh, people from um, Omise Go, yay, Omise Go, um, and, and so forth, right? So, client developers, um, Parity has uh, do, done an excellent job for the last uh, two years uh, maintaining in uh, Ethereum client implementation. Um, Harmony, um, a group of uh, developers maintaining Ethereum Java. Um, Pegasus, um, there's um, a team inside of Consensus. Um, user and developer infrastructure, and look, there's groups inside of Consensus, there's groups inside of uh, cons 
um, in, in you know, com various projects and companies, including Maker has done a lot. Um, there's ver various mobile wallets, uh, Etherscan, EtherChain, Ethplore, you know, like ETH, what, ETH whatever, all, all the wonderful sites that you can use to figure out what, uh, what happens to your Ethereum transaction. You know, ETH gas station, woohoo. So you know, there's really a lot of people that are involved and I think it is also important for us as a community to really kind of celebrate all of their contributions. You know, and you know, like even if we can't um, all find, uh, find ways to support each and every one of them directly to at least you know, like recognize the really valuable contributions that they've all been making. So how can um, the um, Ethereum Community Fund help? So first of all, it can serve as a kind of independent uh, grant giving organization and um, as uh, something that can fund projects um, separately from the Ethereum Foundation and support a broader mandate, including projects that are outside of the Ethereum Foundation's kind of core infrastructure focus. So things that are closer to being applications, things that are closer to being commercially viable in different ways, things that are kind of closer to the user and uh, for, further away from the tech, which is still you know, the Ethereum Foundation's own specialty. And to really help to bring all of the um, Ethereum community projects that are part of the ECF and you know, hopefully upcoming members that will soon join together and um, help them collaborate more. So thank you. Thank you very much, Vitalik. Thank you. So now, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Gavin Wood, President and Founder of Web3 and Co-Founder of Ethereum. Hello. Um, this is a, a very quick um, sort of introduction talk. Um, <clears throat> it's really nice to be um, standing here at the inception of this sort of conglomeration of goodwill um, that is the ECF. Um, it kind of does um, give some reassurance that um, in a decentralized ecosystem like Ethereum, it is possible for independent and separately aligned entities to come together um, and actually create something of, of, uh, of great value. Um, so on behalf of the, the Web3 Foundation, that is one of the few uh, hats that I wear, I'm uh, very much looking forward to working together with our partners uh, in the ECF to uh, try and put these funds to good use. Um, as I said, I'm not going to keep you long. I kind of sworn off doing any kind of public talks until uh, the test net of my project uh, Polkadot is, is running, but I figured um, this is probably a, if I'm going to make an exception, this is probably the best one to make. Um, I'm here mainly to, uh, you know, to give a warm uh, hello to, um, to Aya and, uh, and John Choi and their team. Um, as I said, the many hats I wear sort of allow me to say hello in quite a few different ways. Um, as the uh, sort of uh, uh, co-founder with Vitalik of Ethereum, um, I've got to say that this, uh, you know, even just having a brief, uh, uh, a few brief chances to, uh, to get to know um, Aya and her team, it's filling me with confidence already that the ecosystem is really going to benefit um, from her appointment. Uh, it seems clear that in a short time she's able to work uh, not only tirelessly but also productively um, in, uh, in, in the benefit of Ethereum. Um, and as uh, on behalf of the Web3 Foundation, I'm very much looking forward to um, you know, a close and, uh, and, and fruitful relationship um, cooperating over quite a lot of the goals um, that our two foundations share. And of course, as uh, uh, the guy from Parity Technologies, I'm very much looking forward to putting in a few grant applications in the new, uh, the new grant scheme of the foundation. So yeah, without uh, much more ado, uh, Aya Miyaguchi. Well, um, thank you, Gavin, for the warm introduction. Um, it, not, uh, it's the first time to see you, but uh, I'm the executive director of Ethereum Foundation. I'm Aya Miyaguchi. So if you are familiar with uh, this industry in Japan, probably you are familiar with my face. 
ブロックチェーンの業界に日本人は結構古くからいるんですけれども私は最近の日本人の発表で私は今日は東京の発表で私は今日は東京の発表で私は。まあ、たまたま日本人だったんですけど、私は日本人だったんですけど、私は日本人だったんですけど、私は日本人だったんですけど、私は日本人だったんですけど、私は日本アスビタリックエクスプレインドは、イスラエルのコミュニティファンドです。今日は、私は日本語で話しています。私は日本語で話しています。私は日本語で話しています。私は日本語で話しています。It was about 2012 or 2000. Actually, it was 2011. I first heard about Bitcoin, and before that, I was interested in OBO, and my focus in MBA was sustainable business. And my primary interest was how this business can be contributed to microfinance or economic independence of women. And in developing countries. So that is the, the beginning of my involvement with this industry. And I had an opportunity to visit several places. And actually, it took some time that industry and the business community got ready to accept this. So, originally, uh, in the Initial phase, I was not able to do the, the business related to social impact. But as Israeli business developed, there is more and more opportunity. And now I feel finally I will be able to do what I wanted to do. So that was last year or the year before. And the power of blockchain, of course, there are so many things that blockchain can do, but what I'm interested in is the decentralized technology. There are some things that individuals originally have, such as your right or your right to say what you want to do. The technology has the power to give these rights back to individual. And in San Francisco, I studied business and I learned about sustainability. And there are three pillars of sustainability. So in order to have a sustainable society, there is economic, environmental, and social issues that have to have to be taken care of, otherwise business will not be successful. That is what has been said. Actually, Japan has that kind of a concept, culturally, but when everything is ready and everything is balanced, then there will be success for the business. When I learned that, I thought that is what I can really understand. So, there are several things that I personally I'm interested in the imbalance or inequality of the world, such as hunger, poverty, gender discrimination, or human traffic, or unfair trade. There are lots of imbalance in the world. And all of these issues were created by human beings, created by us, as Albert Einstein said. If people who created the issue tried to solve the problem, that is not possible. Then now we have blockchain. Blockchain is something totally different. And there is a possibility to change the society in a completely different way. That is a technology. So blockchain is something to 
提供してくれるんですけどその中でもイーサリウムは技術的にもすごくセキュリティもしっかりしていてっていうことがあるんですがさらに私が魅力を感じたのはコミュニティが本当に今まで存在しない形で分散型なんですけれどもそういう世の中の問題を大事にする人たちがもともと作った But there are developers who care about social issues, and the community is growing to have an idea to solve the problem all together. So, not only technology, but more than that, we have. パー So, Japanese people probably are not familiar with this, but uh, um, there are about a 15 trillion uh, profit um, arising from human traffic in a year. And uh, there are about uh, 25 million victims, and about 70% of victims are female. So, the reason is the human traffic. Uh, Arising out of a prostitution, and about 60% of those 70% happened in Asia Pacific region. So, if your family become victim of human trafficking and probably be killed at the end of the day, that is happening. So this is what human being does, and if there is no one who tried to solve this, that is a completely unjust society. But if there is some way that technology can help to solve this problem, so I'm not going to talk about the detail of the technology. But let's say if. One woman sent to another country just went to the clinic. Then, by using her fingerprint and able to identify herself, and that information was in public, and her family in other countries were able to find that woman. So if we can help the issues of one percent of two twenty-five million people, that is wonderful. And Ethereum is supporting the technology. So as I said, as a technological tool for social impact, we have the technology to support this. And as I said, why I believe in this is that. Community to solve problem all together, which means there's not only one plane. It was created by Vitalik and founder, but the co-founders, but not only them, but it was open source from the beginning, so everyone can join to make it better. We have this, and with this, we can do something to solve the problems that we cannot solve by ourselves. So, so this is uh, what happened in Taiwan. There was the workshop of one of the scalability solution sharing, and uh, these are not only Ethereum Foundation members, but uh, there are people who found sharing and uh, who use sharing in their community. And uh, we had researchers to discuss these. So it's such an important uh, project to have everyone get together. So we had this photo session. So this is a symbol. This is very symbolic. The people of 
大手の企業とか、ね、雇われているとかっていうのは、本当に自分でコントリビュートしてる。They just, they just found open source and they can contribute by themselves. So they are people with good growth. So community invites other community, and the first time it was just a developer, but now there's NGO uh, companies and the government also. Became interested in Ethereum as well. So there are several products coming up. So Vitalik already explained the foundation. So they are doing the research, education, and the development. So what we do is. So individuals or companies create applications, and we provide decentralized protocol and tool to support DApps. So we are like a coordinator to support them. So what I wanted to say is, from the beginning, there was always a community in the center, and the foundation is to support the community. So community is the center. So to support community is more and more important, and there are grants and the activities of ECF is very, very important so that the community can be active. So I expect a lot to the foundation, and I am so happy that we can make announcement in Japan. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much, Ayaguchi. Thank you very much, Ayaguchi. Okay, with uh, Ayo Miyaguchi, the Executive Director of Ethereum Foundation. And now we will take this time to get ready for the next... Please wait until the stage gets ready. Okay, thank you for your patience. Now we'd like to uh, move on to the introduction of the Ethereum Community Fund. And let me introduce Mr. Wendell Davis. Um, he's a member of original Ethereum founding team and the lead reviewer of Ethereum Dev Glance. And also he's a product design advisor of Omise Go and advisor of Go Golem. So please welcome. Hello. Uh, this introduction will be pretty brief because I'd like to get all the projects up here. Uh, also, if we get two more seats, that would be, that would be good, yes. Um, so I am the uh, interim grants manager for the ECF. Um, my background has been pretty lucky in this space and that I've been kind of involved with a lot of waves of disruption, including being very early with Bitcoin, uh, being involved very early with Ethereum, uh, Omise Go, Golem, uh, and a number of other projects that uh, I've been lucky enough to be connected to. And, uh, you know, one of the sort of themes that have been a kind of part of my career has uh, pretty much involved looking for use cases and looking for people with different perspectives and finding ways to bring them into the space. And by this space, I mean this space of general decentralization promoting applications uh, and technologies. So, this brings me to the point, like, why do I think grants are super important? Uh, why are grants super important? And I think that really says it. Grants are important because we need means of bringing people into the space in ways where they feel comfortable to take maybe a leap of faith. Maybe they're the only person in their organization that sees the potential of some of these technologies and some of these philosophies that we are espousing. Maybe they need that extra little bit of incentive to, to take that leap and to you know, maybe pause or leave their job for a little bit to do that work. Grants are important for outreach. That's my perspective on that. Of course, they're really great internally as well inside the ecosystem. They're great for people that have a, a wild idea and they want to go pursue it. Give them a little bit of money, give them a little bit of time, and see if they can accomplish the goal that they set out to accomplish. But I think grants really, when they're at their full potential, will be one of the greatest outreach tools that we have in the space. They'll be one of the, the means of uh, giving us a chance to give other people a chance, basically. So 
Um, without much further ado, and kind of giving an introduction uh, of, of the reason for these things to being, I'd like to invite the grantees up uh, to have a seat, and we'll have a quick conversation introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Raul Jordan from Prismatic Labs, if you can come up. So per what I was saying about uh, leaving things and taking leaves of faith, so Raul is a, is a, a Teal Fellowship recipient, and uh, he left Harvard actually to pursue Ethereum. So uh, Prismatic Labs is the first independent team that I'm aware of working on a sharding solution that will allow the processing of transactions in parallel without compromising security. So this is a huge win for scalability and really important for Ethereum. So thanks, Raul, for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, Edmund Edgar from Reality Keys. Uh, Edmund is a sort of self, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reality Keys is a sort of self-styled uh, certificate authority for facts. Uh, it's as far as I know, the first smart contract oracle. It was uh, all the way back in 2013. So, uh, you know, his new project, Reality Check, is really, it's something like using economic gains to solve social problems. So, so thanks very much, Edmund. Next up is Yusaku Singa and Shingo Kawano from the Swing By Protocol. SwingBuy is a cross-chain protocol for stablecoin issuance. So uh, it'll enable BTC Cash and Bitcoin to be used on Ethereum. Uh, that will you know, enable them then to be used on things like decentralized exchanges and, and so on. So thanks very much for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Matt Condon and Michael Perara of Excellent. Excellent is creating open standards for crypto assets and so-called crypto collectibles. These are unique assets in the blockchain that uh, you know, may or may not be, well, let's say in this case, may not be currencies. Um, they're also working on Gnarly, which uh, is a platform and, a, pro and a, uh, a tool to help make blockchain user interfaces something on par with modern web UIs uh, in terms of responsiveness, which is challenging for reasons that I, that I hope they'll go into. So thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, and next up, uh, Josh Stark from Ethprize. Josh, come on up. So uh, Ethprize is a quite special initiative uh, created in partnership with TrueBit, the Web3 Foundation, and L4 Ventures. And uh, it aims to organize large bounties to incentivize the focused development of solutions to major struggles faced in the world of Ethereum development. Uh, the team actually conducted 50 one-hour interviews with various Ethereum developers across the space, uh, and they made their findings public. So this is how they got to the bottom of actual hard research. So thanks very much, Josh. So I would actually like to start uh, this by, you know, really this is an introduction of your projects uh, to, to, to the world, as it were. And uh, I'd kind of like to start uh, in order, if you don't mind, just uh, giving, giving some background about yourselves and uh, your project. And if we have time, we'll go into some additional questions. So, so Edmund, maybe you want to go ahead and give us a start to that. Yeah, so, um, so we started um, working in this space, I guess, back in 2013. Um, we were trying to deal with um, what's called the Oracle problem, which is the problem that if, you've, um, if you're trying to use a smart contract to decide where some money goes or where some asset goes or, or what happens, um, the, uh, the blockchain, the, the, the nodes that are, that are ver verifying this tra the transactions need to know what's going on in the world outside the blockchain. Right? They, they need to know what's happening in reality. Um, so we set up Reality Keys um, to basically on, on the assumption that the information that you needed would be on a website somewhere. And you could pull that information off the website and, um, um, and uh, sign it and get it to the blockchain. Um, and th then what we found recently was that um, a lot of people were asking us for quite sort of custom hu human language queries. Um, so we wanted to build something that could answer any question that you might want, want to ask. Um, so we built um, Reality Check, which uh, uses this inc economic game um, that you, you can ask it any question you want to and it crowdsources the, the decision making and hopefully incentivizes people to, um, to put in the right answers. Um, and while we were building that, we were thinking of it as something that was going to be used by, by contracts, but um, this whole fake news thing blew up and it turns out there's, th there's this kind of crisis of information, kind of crisis of truth on the internet that people are having a hard time 
working out how to get good information. And it seems like this could be something that, that's used, consumed not just by contracts, but also by, by humans. Um, so it's really exciting to be working on this. We've got it um, live on the uh, Rinkby test net, hopefully mainnet very soon. And then we've got a whole bunch more things planned. Um, thanks to the, the generosity of uh, the community fund and, uh, and the company you see there. Uh, hi, my name is Matt. This is Michael. Uh, we're working on a project called Excellent, uh, spelled X-L-N-T. Um, it is a collection of experiments and experiences around the concept of digital ownership. Um, and that's very vague, but what it means is we're very interested in how uh, digitally owning things without a middleman kind of changes really just how we own things in general. And this goes into owning art and tokenizing securities and uh, in-game assets and all kinds of different things. Um, and to create some of these experiences that we're really interested in, uh, we're building some developer tooling as well, uh, one of which is Gnarly. Um, Gnarly is this um, approach for solving the concept of what I call severe asynchronicity, where on the web, a web request can take three seconds, which is a pretty long time. So what web uh, websites do is when you click the like button on Twitter, uh, it just automatically shows like, hey, you liked it, good job. Uh, but that hasn't, Twitter doesn't know about that yet. Um, but that's called optimistic UI. It just supposes that the thing succeeds and then shows you that it does. Uh, we can do the same thing for blockchain interfaces uh, to make them very, very reactive and very, very uh, user friendly and bring them up to par with the web today. Um, so we're working on that in like collaboration with the community uh, because uh, pretty much every project will need to solve this sort of issue. And if we solve them together at a low framework level, uh, everyone will benefit. Um, and we're also working on some in-game assets. Yeah, so we're also working on the ability to issue in-game assets on the blockchain. Um, we view this as an exciting way for gamers to kind of get compensated for the hours that they put in the games that they play, um, and also a potential new revenue stream for uh, content creators and stuff like that. I think the, the common goal is to um, reduce the barrier to entry for uh, developers and content creators to uh, build blockchain apps, essentially, yeah. Yeah, and that's really exciting. Um, if you're interested in following up on these sort of like digital uh, ownership news things, we've built a uh, token curated feed of um, non-fungible token news, and this is a feed on Reddit, Twitter, and Telegram, where um, people, a set of collaborators, can vote on which news articles make it into the feed, and uh, can then, anyone can follow along and contribute and earn points and so on, and then have more uh, influence over what goes into this feed. And that's called uh, TFNFT, which is a big acronym, but token feed, non-fungible tokens, and you can find it on Telegram and Twitter. Uh, and if you like curating things, get involved. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Yusaku Senga. Uh, founder of uh, DRI and Swing by Project as a lead. And Kawano is our business developer and project uh, supporter. Uh, the Swing by Project is, uh, brings to a value of the BTC to the Israel networks. Uh, this uh, is a simply architecture is used by the future contract. The, this is a case of the BTC. Uh, the BTC, uh, to create the BTC token, uh, once uh, A and B to create the future contract, each uh, participant, um, creates the BTC token to settlement uh, in, uh, when the BTC token bound in Bitcoin's HTLC contract. So, our approach is simply a uh, uh, context of the de decentralized exchange. So the BTC to token bound to the contract, the BTC uh, is uh, resumed by the HTC on Bitcoin transaction. So our project is started by uh, two months ago and starting a, a first phase of the MVP. And um, our project makes some uh, uh, approach of the uh, plasma chain, shadow chain to use uh, somebody uh, Charles chain's project. So 
our uh, approach is uh, basically the technical things, but it depends on the uh, uh, mechanism on the market. So to explain the Kawano is explain the on market ex uh, statistics. Yeah. Okay, maybe as you, as you all know, maybe his brain is specially tuned into the Ethereum blockchains, so his explanation is just a little bit short. So let me explain the use cases and also the going futures things. Uh, then maybe our futures and our use cases, just uh, okay, the BTC. So we're just focusing on the BTC. And the BTC is just going to the Ethereum networks. This is our futures and this is our purpose. So uh, the, if we got the BTC liquidity, and if we got the BTC functions into the Ethereum networks, I mean the DApps and every other things, just like a P2P lendings, uh, just like a financial services in the DApps, and uh, with these functions, BTC has enhanced, and also the, uh, the Ethereum's uh, decentralized situation is more powerful. This is our futures, uh, this is our products. And also maybe going future, not only the BTC, BTC Cash and the other currency, just like it's not in the Ethereum networks yet. So we are just going to, to combine one thing, everything into the Ethereum's, and then Ethereum is the centralized of the DApps world. This is our futures. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Josh Stark. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a company called L4, and we do a, a number of things. Uh, you might know us from work on state channels uh, or the stable fund. Um, but like many people in this industry, I wear a few hats, uh, and today I'm really happy to be here representing ETH Prize. Um, so what is ETH Prize? Um, quite simply, it is an effort to identify what the critical missing components um, in the Ethereum ecosystem are, and then fund large bounties to get those things built. So there's kind of two components to what we're doing. The first component is about learning and about research. So we're doing more than 100 interviews with top developers in this space, asking them what tools do they use every day, what tools are missing, what are their daily frustrations, building applications on Ethereum, and what do they need to be more effective? Because as any developer that works in this space know, there are a lot of kind of critical things that exist in any other environment that don't exist yet for Ethereum. So where we've done about 60 of those so far, and once those interviews are complete, we'll be releasing uh, a comprehensive report summing up everything we've learned from those interviews and giving it to the community as a way of kind of directing um, people to know what to work on, um, to know what's missing, uh, where the critical priorities are. At the same time, we're trying to organize large bounties to build some of the tools that we're identifying from that research. So the idea is to kind of like really financially motivate teams to work on critical developer tools that might not be profit driven, that might just be open source things that everyone needs. But the idea is that we want to take teams away from working on, um, you know, kind of short term financial gain, whether that's an ICO or something else, and building the things that the whole ecosystem really needs right now. So we're starting off with what we're calling kind of like ETH Prize MVP um, with two bounties that were obvious candidates. Uh, and the generous grant from the ECF is going directly to both of these bounties. The first of these uh, is called the Ethereum Package Manager or ETH PM. Uh, and it's building on work that's already been done by Piper Miriam and others um, to completely, uh, to build a complete package manager um, with, that is full featured um, for Ethereum development. Uh, this is a critical thing that's been missing for a while uh, that we think is really important. The other is an open source block explorer. Um, many of the block explorers that exist today for Ethereum are closed source. Um, and that can be a problem for the community that needs to add new features um, or especially teams that are working on side chains or related solutions where they really do need uh, an open source solution that they can tweak to their own needs uh, and give to their user base. Um, so this is being worked on right now um, by a team at POA Network um, and the, the goal is to release this open source with full feature parity to existing closed source block explorers uh, to the community. So those are the two we're starting with, and then as we identify other critical needs from our research, we'll be adding additional bounties to the ETH Prize project uh, with the goal of getting all these done and shipped as soon as possible. Hey everyone, my name is Raul Jordan, and I'm here representing Prismatic Labs. We're currently working on implementing a sharding client for the Ethereum protocol. And for those that are unfamiliar, sharding is a way to scale the blockchain by splitting the blockchain into K partitions, where essentially every node in the network um, can process transactions, you know, 
it, nodes don't have to download the entire blockchain, but can instead process transactions in parallel. However, this comes with the, the key problem of doing, doing this while also not introducing additional security leaks or additional requirements on the nodes running the blockchain. So it's a very tough problem that you know, currently Ethereum Foundation's um, research team is working on alongside a bunch of other teams. So we are an independent team of developers uh, in Ethereum that assembled and came together to you know, solve this problem. We, are currently, you know, we currently started our development and have started kind of the phase one spec of sharding, which you can all find online if you look up on ETHResearch and kind of what's going on in the space. And we are really excited to be here. Uh, it's a huge honor to receive the funding from the ECF and uh, one of the things that I want to add is that it's, it's very possible for somebody who wants to get into protocol development and hasn't been, you know, feels like it's a high barrier to entry. It's very possible for you to get up to speed by reading up on, you know, like the key sources and studying kind of the forefront of research on ETH research and looking at the current repositories. So I highly recommend those that want to dive into this um, to not be intimidated and just take the time to learn the concepts, understand the glossaries, understand what's going on throughout the public forums. I think we've been really grateful about the fact that the community is so open and that they are so, so willing to help out independent teams to work on this. And that's why we're here. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in following our progress, look up Prismatic Labs or uh, check out Geth sharding. Uh, we're implementing sharding for the Go Ethereum client. So always happy to chat. So thank you very much. OK, so we have about 10 more minutes. And I guess I want to just actually go with what you were saying and maybe pass this back up uh, uh, the chain, no pun intended. Um, I mean, talk to me a bit more about like the impact. Why did you choose to go independent rather than joining the Ethereum Foundation to do your work, for example? Like, what, what, what is the impact that independent teams can have? I think it allows us to frame our own conclusions and come up with our own solutions to problems that might be just purely research phase based at the moment. So when we started working on sharding, um, a lot of the documentation that was out there was more of like a high level research spec. And there was nobody that we were aware of at the time that had actually taken the time to translate that into an implementation and into code. And us being, you know, software engineers being, being very, very pragmatic and being really excited about developing this. We just decided to take it into our own hands because there weren't as many teams working on this. And part of that is, you know, the financial incentive and also because um, people feel like it's such a hard problem and a high barrier to entry that they just, they just leave, it, leave it to the researchers or people in the official foundation to work on it. However, you know, we knew it was a hard problem, but we weren't afraid to just dive in and to see if we can, you know, take a stab at it. Josh, you have any comments about uh, independent teams and the kind of impact they can have? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think in general, it's a thing that we all believe in this community that, um, you know, uh, solutions that are distributed, solutions that uh, allow many different teams to take different approaches um, often come to great outcomes. Um, we should be incentivizing independent teams that might have a different perspective, might have a different background, might have different interests to pursue their own solution to a given problem, uh, rather than relying on any one entity, whatever that happens to be, uh, to do it themselves. So I definitely think that kind of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom is a good approach um, to building out the ecosystem. Okay, the R team is just focusing on the E3Ms and also the BTC. Uh, and also, we are especially focusing on the liquidities of these kind of things. Uh, maybe it's uh, just between, just like a bridge of these two kind of BTC and E3Ms. So it's, uh, that's why we need to the independent teams and that's why we need to settle the very original st standard points of that. So that's why and we are standing here and also that's why I maybe, uh, maybe the grant from the ECF communities. So they're just going forward, we are just uh, solved the, the problem of some kind of liquidity issues of bitcoins, not the ethereums, of bitcoins, and also the has power of the decentralized situations in the ethereums. This is our solving problems, and uh, this is our the dependence points. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm very much um, along the vibes of uh, trying many different things from a bunch of different perspectives and kind of uh, seeing where that gets us. That's actually kind of the beauty of this whole decentralized uh, crypto economic theory space is that a bunch of independent actors, uh, regardless of um, no shared goals, can work together because of independent goals. Um, and that's, that's actually really, really interesting from uh, like a game theory perspective. And we can apply that at the uh, community level as well. Yeah, so I, I, I think also for us, the, the key thing is, uh, is, I guess, that you have the freedom and, and kind of the space to formulate your own understanding of the problems that, that need to be solved. Um, 
it, you know, it, um, the, um, you know, we, we started out seeing the Oracle problem in one particular way, and we've come to see it very differently. And, and being an independent, and, and I think the way that we're approaching it is very different to the way that um, some of the other actors in the, in the space are approaching it. Um, so that independence gives us the, the ability to try something that um, maybe we, we wouldn't have thought to try if we haven't been independent. Okay, thanks very much, guys. So each team is uh, receiving $100,000, uh, and uh, you know, we will be announcing further grants uh, in the coming months. But uh, for now, I want to thank all of you guys very much for coming and for coming all the way, in some cases, coming all the way to Japan. And uh, uh, really look forward to seeing the progress on your project. So thanks very much. And thank you. Cheers. OK, thank you very much, everyone. So now um, I would like to, make, uh, to move on to the question and answer session. So if you have it, oh, please stay. <laughs> please stay a while. <laughs> So I'd like to take questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please raise your hands. Our staff will make your way on your way with the microphone. So do you have any questions? Oh, okay. Hi. So, can I, ha can I have your name and uh, uh, your company name first? Hi, uh, my name is Mark Baywin. I'm from the Bounties Network. Um, my question for you guys is, obviously, um, you know, having funding is great. Um, I'm curious to hear from you guys, from each of the teams individually, um, what you guys plan on spending the money on, or is it, you know, hiring new developers? Um, is it s sort of sustaining yourselves, the teams you guys have right now? Um, I'm just kind of curious to see that. Mostly frivolous things like food and rent. Um, <laughs> and honestly, that's about it. <laughs> Good. I think for us, we're thinking about uh, creating implementation bounties for some of the problems that are, are you know, sharding entails. It's really hard from our experience to get people ramped up in understanding how they can contribute to something like this because they have so much knowledge. There's so much knowledge that you need before you can jump in. So we've been putting a lot of effort into writing clear documentation and making sure that people with similar backgrounds as us um, that were engineers before, either from a web application background or such, to understand how to contribute. So we're putting a lot of effort on that front and then being able to create implementation bounties for people to jump in based on our documentation and start contributing for some financial incentive. And uh, yeah, so that, that's going to be a huge, the grant is going to be a huge help for that. Uh, in our case, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the money is being split between the two bounties we've identified so far. Um, but, but a further point maybe on our financial incentives, um, one of the things we really believe is we need to provide like large financial incentives to teams to build these projects. Uh, it's not just about cost recovery for these teams, it's about what is the opportunity cost versus the other things they could be doing when instead they're building open source tooling. So we really think it's important to kind of think about what these talent developers could be doing otherwise and then make sure that the bounty is large enough to be attractive to good teams. Actually, in our case, uh, the team is only the seven girls. And also maybe uh, we just are uh, only focusing on the, this project. And also maybe uh, any other girls, uh, especially maybe in Japan, uh, Japan has so the very the rare uh, opportunity to get uh, to, in, uh, to get the to, to technology things. So maybe these guys they also would like to just uh, make effort to us. So we need to just uh, just combine to them. And also maybe the, to create everything as every other situations opportunities uh, to make uh, contributions to with the, any other companies or something. We just uh, pay something for that. Yeah. Yeah. More seriously, um, I mean that is pretty much the entirety of the budget is food and rent. But uh, there, Gnarly itself um, is a framework, but you can do a lot of things with it, um, one of which is creating APIs for developers uh, for indexing tokens or indexing um, like who owns what crypto kitty and providing very convenient APIs for that, gas price oracles, et cetera. And so uh, one possible avenue is subsidizing that and kind of giving that uh, back to the community for as long as possible. So I guess two big things for us. Um, one is kind of, kind of auditing and bug bounties. Um, in particular, auditing is a, a, quite a tough problem for, for smart contracts that you really want an unrelated person who isn't in your team um, to be looking at your code and, and trying to find holes in it. 
um, and those people um, usually would be very expensive. We've been very lucky to have somebody who just loved our project and, and, and offered to, to do it for, for free, but um, there's a bunch more stuff we want to do and there's only so much FOHA we can uh, take that. Um, and then the other thing we want to, to do is to grow the team a little bit. Um, there's somebody I want to get involved to, um, who, who I just found out was available and I thought if only I had the money I could bring him in, he could do so much good for us and uh, hey presto, the money arrived. Uh, everything's great. Okay, thank you very much. So, any other question? Okay, um, the uh, the mic will be Okay, may I have your name first? Hi, uh, this is Yoshi from Yahoo Japan Capital. Um, for a uh, question for you guys is, uh, what's your prediction prediction for uh, a main, uh, I would say, key changes or key developments? Um, for this year and next in the blockchain space. This is, thank you. We're going to see a lot more blockchains. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Blockchains on blockchains. Um, no, but actually, um, one trend that I definitely see is um, in these open uh, platforms, uh, their curation is a very important part of basically creating a good user experience. Um, that's something that centralized uh, companies excel at, is they can pay people to curate their platform, they can do uh, bot detection and all that kind of stuff. But in completely open, decentralized platforms, you don't really have that. And so we have to devise mechanisms for uh, decentrally curating things. Um, and there are a lot of areas of uh, research going on now, token curated registries, curation markets, bonding curves, etc. Um, it's a very interesting uh, aspect of this whole decentralized movement, and I think it's going to be just become more and more important uh, as the years go on. To uh, add to that point, I, I would say that uh, you know usability is probably going to be one of the big themes of the next couple of years. I mean, we've, as a space, I would say you know not particularly paid a lot of attention to user experience for a while because it was something like the domain of you know, uber geeks or something, but uh, we're finally at the point now, obviously, where it's time to start paying attention to that. So I think that usability and end-user applications that make sense, and thus the onboarding and things like that, is also going to be a really, really important part of that. So, uh, I think one big theme, well, maybe two big themes. One big theme is, is going to be um, all the work that's being done on kind of layer two solutions and these kind of like short-term scaling solutions. Um, not all of these will be kind of uh, available through applications immediately, but there will be a lot of work done on them in the next 12 months, and we should expect to see some uh, actually live. And so I'm talking about things like state channels, plasma, side chains, um, proof of authority chains, and inter-blockchain protocols. Um, those are going to be kind of a big focus for everybody. And I think the other is that we're going to start to see that there are um, that ICOs were just kind of one of the first funding and incentivization mechanisms that people figured out and tried to do at mass scale um, to mixed results. I think we're going to see that there's many, many different possibilities um, to use what Ethereum is capable of uh, to finance projects, to monetize, to find, incentivize teams, uh, to monetize applications. Uh, and we're going to kind of start seeing more of those over the next 12 months. Um, things like token curated registries are a great example of, of other approaches to that problem. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more work on security and privacy considerations on public blockchains. Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately on the news about you know, like being able to protect your data, um, making sure that you know, we, have, we have good cryptographic schemes to ensure that public blockchains are, you know, we, that corporations um, would consider them in the future for their work using techniques such as zero-knowledge proofs or other ways of being able to obfuscate your transactions on the blockchain. So I hope that we're going to be seeing more you know, stronger developments on this front and making it so that people see that security and privacy on public blockchains is vastly underrated and seeing more people gravitate towards improving that and making it so that you know, it's strong enough for many people to use on a daily basis. Okay, I think we're going to see crypto kitties squared, by which I mean um, all these dApps that people are working on are going to, not all of them are going to ship, but a lot of them are going to ship. Um, and they're going to have some, some quite amazing um, benefits from working together with each other. Um, so one of the fascinating things about Ethereum is that contracts can talk to other contracts. Um, and you have not just your own application, but an entire ecosystem that is working together. Um, so a very simple example would be if you want to make a flight insurance application, you need your Oracle project that tells you whether the, the plane was late. Um, you probably want a stable coin um, so that you don't 
don't have to um, uh, to use a fluctuating uh, currency, and you need the, the flight insurance DAP itself as a, as a very minimum. You need those three things working together. Um, so I think the, the more these projects get deployed, we're going to see kind of multiplier effects as, as the, um, the, the benefits uh, kind of increase themselves. Okay. So we think maybe from a little bit uh, different point of view, maybe the usability should be should be the most important things, and also maybe are uh, visible, usable, and uh, touchable things should be more increasing. So the, this year maybe the all the all the developers, all the engineers is considering okay, what is a usable project? What is a the touchable project for the, the general peoples? For the all the okay, all the people can touch that right? just like a CryptoKitties or something. So maybe this should be the more growth, the market, and so this should be more powerful for us, I think. No, you probably have something to say about that, right? Oh, so sorry, I spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> I said you probably have something to say about that in terms of uh, crypto assets and crypto collectibles. Oh, absolutely. I didn't want to plug it because that's exactly right what we're working on. Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. I think crypto assets, um, the concept of tokenizing things is going to really change how we own things in general. Um, I don't know that one, any specific niche is going to change the world. Uh, tokenizing art, for example, is curious and useful. Uh, tokenizing security is pretty useful. Uh, but altogether, um, combined with just all of this crypt cryptographic ownership, removing the middleman uh, who decides that you own something uh, brings digital, digital ownership much closer to uh, par with physical ownership of things you own, like your house and your car. Um, although both of those also have middlemen. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's very, very interesting and certainly will uh, continue to grow in the future. And you can see that happening already with non-fungible tokens. Okay, thank you very much. And I think I saw the other hand, uh, the microphone, please. Uh, hi, my name is David Corbin from Tech in Asia, uh, and it, it seems like one of the ways to move Ethereum forward is by having more developers in the space, more people who want to go for the grant. Um, on that note, I'm kind of curious, what was your entry point into the community, and why did you choose to make this your main focus, despite the other options that are out there? Raul, why don't you start with you? Sure. I think it's because the community is a lot more open than others that I've encountered. I mean, obviously, when I was getting started, I was considering, should I be working on, you know, working on Bitcoin development? Should I be working on Ethereum? Should I be work what, what options are the best to work on right now? And I think how open and communicative this community is uh, really got me dragged in. Um, being able to, the fact that you can just create an Ethereum improvement proposal and push that to a repository, the fact that you can talk to core developers on like Gitter chats or Reddit and other places is just like, you know, super... It's just really exciting um, as an independent developer and makes you want to get involved. Also, people are very willing to share resources and tell you how you can get started on contributing. Um, and I think that's what, that's what really pulled me in compared to like working on other blockchain protocols. Why did you not do an ICO? Why did I not do an ICO? Because I think the technology was not ready yet. So we, we need to scale first. We need to work on the core infrastructure first before we do that. Um, and you know, drawing to the point that you guys made earlier that while all these projects depend on kind of having a stable coin, having scalability, having security, so all these different things that you're just hoping to get accomplished, and you know, after you do your fundraising round, we're just it was just really felt really really like pie in the sky for me, very 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 far off. So I I much rather work on the core improvements and the infrastructure before we get to that stage. I think I can make more of a tangible impact on that front. Uh, personally, what really kind of made me uh, want to be part of the Ethereum community um, when I first got involved um, was that this community kind of has their eye on the much larger picture and the larger impact that all this can have on the world. Um, you know, thinking back to Aya's presentation, uh, it's important to kind of have our, 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 our eyes on kind of like the long term. I and mean, we're not just trying to make this inefficient computer a little bit more efficient for, you know, arbitrary purposes. We're doing it because we believe that, you know, in the long term, once we've solved these critical scaling problems, it's really going to change the world in a substantive way uh, and hopefully in a better way. Um, so that's what really kind of made me first interested. And it's another example of why this, the ECF and the grant program is so important that there's a lot of work to be done before we get to that vision, uh, that it really is a long-term thing, and this community understands that. And for our cases, maybe 
Dar. He, the singer son, is the originally comes from three years to, uh, for just in, the engaging in the Ethereums, but the, maybe the team is not the gathering. So maybe recently the Ethereum world and all the other blockchain things is just more the popular, and then the, any other guys is just coming to us, and then he may create the teams. That's the maybe timings between the ECF and our Sengosan is creating a team at the same time. And then this is a real opportunity for us to just make a more broader and more bigger than uh, is, uh, his considerations. And also maybe, uh, yeah, um, why Ethereum? That's very really tough questions, but uh, maybe why blockchain is the same things. Maybe blockchain and Ethereum changes the world. This should be happen, uh, as ISN says. So Ethereum is for the people, I think, this is not for the company, this is not for the government, this is not for the very uh, centralized persons. But uh, I believe, we believe the things, and also maybe uh, just based on this beliefs, maybe we're just going on. That's the thing. Yeah, I really resonate with pretty much everything y'all said. Um, I had came for the technology and stayed for the philosophy uh, that I found, um, especially around self-sovereignty and really just having um, you know personal control over your life and your experiences and who you interact with, interact with and so on. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the community is really, really welcoming. Um, this is the first time uh, that I've worked in a space where I feel like I'm uh, like working with people on a shared vision uh, and really at the forefront of this whole movement. And that's really, really exciting, um, especially um, just the, the amount of impact that a small team a small group of people can have is, uh, you can't really find that anywhere else that I know of. Yeah, I think for me, the, um, the global coordination between all these, all these projects, um, it's like one of the first true technologies that is truly global. Um, I feel like even the web consolidated around Silicon Valley, where a lot of the big projects in the space are not in Silicon Valley. Um, and that's exciting to me. I think as humans, we will need to come together uh, to solve our global issues. Um, and that's what really excites me about blockchains, yeah. Um, so, for, so for blockchains, I mean, you can replace a company with a computer program. That's amazing. Um, we, we started out trying to do this kind of thing with, with, with Bitcoin. Um, and we originally had a product for Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin scripting is not as lovely as Ethereum scripting, to put it mildly. Um, but, but, but also the reason why we absolutely had to, to, to move to, to Ethereum is that Ethereum is where everybody else is. Ethereum is where all of the interesting, really useful, well, I, I can't come quite, quite so old, but um, the vast majority of the, the interesting productive projects in the space, I think, are happening on Ethereum. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we still have time to take one more question from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your Okay. Hello, I'm Kia Ishii. I'm working at a startup company which creates distributed storage system. We don't use any blockchain, but we um, distribute system. So, and uh, me, myself, has built some blockchain application using Ethereum to integrate our storage software with this blockchain system. And that's what uh, the main point was to have some I'd say, uh, we want to have some benefit out of from blockchain because blockchain is much famous and much attractive compared to storage. And so we want to combine with blockchain and tell everyone that we are doing the blockchain stuff, right? So our problem was to how can we contribute or how can we do a business with enterprise, I mean, large enterprise companies. And I'm aware that large enterprise, they are also have strong interest in blockchains, but they are a little bit slower compared to startups, and they're more, maybe, I should say, they're more scared. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I would like to ask you, did you ever explain such a, uh, experience such difficulty doing a business with a large enterprise? And how did you overcome that problem? I mean, how did you propose your proposal to those large enterprise to make them convinced to walk with you. I think the first thing to be clear about is why are you using blockchain for? And you know, at the Ethereum event uh, yesterday, Joseph Poon made a great point that 
you know, if you don't, if you, if, if your, if your business is not, um, does not benefit from the, from the core principles of using blockchain technology, then there's kind of no point to using it in the first place. So I guess answering that question first, exactly what aspect of your business will it benefit from? Are you removing a key intermediary such that the cost will be much lower if you use blockchain, um, or are you not? And I think uh, just figuring this out um, and really understanding how this can have a tangible value proposition on the business just answers a lot of those questions from the beginning. Um, I think I think that's that's one of the key things that I've noticed from chatting with people at enterprise and understanding that a lot of them just kind of want to see how they can apply it, uh, but understanding how, how the cost will be reduced from removing intermediaries and whether that will be real and tangible is what must be answered in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I would say in completely trusted settings like uh, most enterprise uh, environments where you have you know traditional laws and stuff to hold people accountable, uh, blockchain doesn't shine so much. It works particularly well in areas where there is partial trust or no trust at all. Um, and so if, yeah, again, if your business case doesn't, uh, if blockchain does not provide value to your business case, uh, I would certainly not use it. Uh, the, the simple flow chart of should I use a blockchain is no. And then like maybe, but you really have to think about it. Um, so that's, that's the default case. Uh, I, I think it all depends on what, what your integration looks like and you know, what the platform that you're integrating with looks like and all those kinds of things because you know, it's just a tool really and you could cut it a million different ways. I, you know, if you want to come and find me afterwards, we could talk about that. I'd be interested to hear how you're integrating it and like, what your plans are there. You know, I give my thoughts. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. So this, uh, that concludes this uh, question and answer session. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Please go back to the And finally, we move on to the photo session next. So please wait for a moment. Okay, if you have any qu uh, requests from the class, please let me know.
Okay, thank you very much. This concludes the photo session, and we will restart the second session from 3:40 p.m. 3:40 p.m. So we still have 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will we will resume the session shortly. So please um, kindly go back to your seat. We will start shortly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to start the session two. And the uh, sec session two will be the founders panel. So I would like to introduce panelists on stage first. Um, first of all, founder of Tendermint and co-creator of Cosmos, Mr. Jay Kwong. That's me. Thank you. And <laughs> okay. And the founder and CEO of Golan, Mr. Julian Z uh, Zawin Stolsky. Zawin Stolsky, happy to be here. <laughs> and Dr. Gavin Wood, uh, president and founder of Web3 and co-founder of Ethereum. Right. Cheers. And founder and CEO of Omise and Omise Go, Mr. Jun Hasegawa. Hello, <laughs> Hello, I'm Japanese. And lastly, um, QJ Wong, Asia lead of Maker Dao. Uh, Minasan, konnichiwa. Everyone, nice des. to meet you. I'm Japanese. Denai -yo. Denai -yo. Actually, no, I'm not Japanese. Japanese, sorry. <laughs> okay, and the moderator will be the Thomas Grinko, Ethereum advisor. So I will pass the microphone to Thomas now. Thank you very much. So um, I'm Thomas, I'm an advisor to Ethereum and um, many uh, projects in the space, including uh, some which are on the stage. And uh, I, I would like this panel to be uh, fairly uh, open and, and uh, flowing, because uh, actually uh, many of the people here, uh, in fact, I would say everyone here, has been uh, working in uh, Ethereum uh, and in blockchain in general for uh, many years. And, uh, uh, know each other and have uh, collaborated on a number of uh, initiatives in the past. So uh, we feel very lucky today to be able to be here uh, together to uh, discuss uh, Ethereum Community Fund and uh, why it is that uh, Ethereum Community Fund exists and what are the goals for uh, Ethereum Community Fund. So maybe maybe I can begin uh, by asking uh, Jay, uh, the uh, creator uh, of, of Tendermint and, and co-founder of uh, Cosmos Network, to uh, start with a little bit of explanation of uh, what uh, is Cosmos uh, and, and what is Cosmos within the Ethereum uh, and, and blockchain in general uh, ecosystem. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit also about you know, the, the, how is this related to ECF? Mm -hmm. So, uh, hello. Um, uh, Cosmos uh, Hub, uh, so the Cosmos project is, um, uh, it's really about connecting blockchains together, uh, especially um, sovereign blockchains. So, uh, it's about connecting all the blockchains together into a network to um, uh, make it easier to uh, you transfer tokens from one blockchain to another blockchain uh, without exchanging. Uh, so it's not about uh, exchanging bitcoins for ether or anything like that. It's about pegging uh, uh, bitcoins from one chain and, and moving your bitcoins to another chain. Um, and this requires um, a lot of uh, technical infrastructure that we've been developing with uh, Tendermint. Um, and uh, the main benefit of the Cosmos uh, network when it launches, and it will launch very soon, the, the benefit is really about interoperability and um, it's about uh, a proof of stake experiment because uh, uh, the Cosmos uh, blockchain is powered by Tendermint, which is a, um, a proof of stake solution based on classical Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms. Um, 
So uh, it's, it's really about bringing projects together and also it's about um, you know, bringing safety and uh, efficiency by, by creating a common protocol for token transfers for all uh, blockchain um, applications in, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Uh, the way it's related to uh, the ECF is because uh, Tendermint was always um, about um, um, it's, it's a very technical and um, uh, um, technically complex and uh, challenging um, infrastructure that, um, that, that happens to really benefit, um, that can really benefit Ethereum uh, today uh, because, uh, as we all know, Ethereum has, has scaling challenges. But uh, so, uh, for example, recently uh, we announced the uh, intent to try to get the Cosmos hub and the, the governance system of the Cosmos blockchain to uh, adopt uh, uh, a hard spoon. Uh, so that's going to be lost in translation, but uh, it's, it's like a hard fork. <laughs> I can't imagine how that's being translated, but uh, yeah, it's about bringing the Ethereum uh, uh, you know, ecosystem and, and kind of uh, translating it over to the Cosmos network. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, what we're creating is, is very interoperable. You know, it, it's, it's very uh, sim symbiotic with everything that Ethereum has created. Um, and also, it's also because uh, Ethereum, we believe, has uh, one of the best, or is the best um, uh, development community that, uh, that can collaborate and actually innovate on things that are really important for this space, such as uh, interoperability and uh, proof of stake and uh, Turing complete, you know, smart contract languages. I think uh, all of that uh, is, is being innovated by the Ethereum community, and uh, I, I feel like I feel that we are lucky to be part of it. So I'm really glad to be here. And uh, uh, I'm very excited about the ECF because uh, it's really about funding uh, infrastructure projects and bringing uh, additional projects into this ecosystem so that we can all work, uh, collaborate uh, as, as um, you know, friends. So I'm going to maybe like jump around a little bit for most uh, topical continuity. Um, I'd like to address uh, Gavwood because uh, Gavwood is uh, the co-founder of uh, Ethereum, uh, did so much work to uh, create the architecture, I wrote the yellow paper uh, specification, and uh, now he has uh, expanded the, uh, the view and the vision to uh, also have the Web3 Foundation, which he has uh, uh, also helped to found and uh, making the project Polkadot, among uh, many others. So this is an interesting uh, thing, because uh, aside from Ethereum Foundation, there are also uh, other foundations. In fact, uh, Jae Kwan has also started the Interchain Foundation. And uh, uh, it is interesting that there are multiple uh, nonprofit uh, initiatives that are looking to build uh, within the blockchain space in a way that is highly complementary with uh, the Ethereum vision. So maybe if, Gav, you can talk a little bit about uh, the Web3 and, uh, and the Polkadot and, and how it relates to Ethereum Community Fund. Sure. So when we began um, Ethereum back in uh, late 2013, early 2014, it was... Um, it was very clear that this was, you know, a significant iteration upon blockchain, uh, upon Bitcoin, as, as it was called back then. No one was really talking about blockchain. Um, and um, it was, it took a little while before we really kind of got to grips with what it was that we were building and how it might be used. Um, one of the sort of conversations I remember having back in uh, January 2014 was, um, you know, what's an Ethereum client going to look like? You know, how are people going to interact with it? And there was a sort of general idea that, well, there'd probably be applications. I remember um, actually Wendell was, was floating around at the time, and, uh, and there was Hive Wallet, which if you probably don't remember, but it was sort of an application-based um, Bitcoin wallet. And there was an idea that there'd be something fairly similar for Ethereum. Over a few months, this idea sort of um, solidified in my mind after you know, sort of various conversations and time thinking. And what we eventually 
sort of what, well, what I eventually described in a post back in uh, April 2014 was um, essentially a, a web platform, so something that looks very much like a traditional web browser, um, but powered by decentralized technologies, of which Ethereum was, um, was a very important um, component. And the, the difference between um, this um, new sort of web technology stack and the current, um, as it was, web 2.0 stack was really one of um, um, uh, decentralization and uh, cryptographic certainty. So it was essentially what something that we've come to be known as like trust freedom or, or, or low to zero trust um, uh, technologies being used so that we understand um, precisely uh, what it is uh, that we're giving up when we use services and we have greater control over that as well. So Web3 Foundation really exists um, to sort of push through on that vision um, in tandem with foundations like the Ethereum Foundation and funds like the Ethereum Community um, uh, Fund in order to um, not necessarily purely uh, push forward blockchain or any particular blockchain, but rather to push forward the um, ecosystem of decentralized applications and in particular, general platforms for decentralized applications as a whole. Um, and we look, we take a very decentralized view even to this, uh, in so much as we like the idea of a, um, a very pluralistic platform. So one where there are many different technologies potentially competing with each other that fall under the same umbrella uh, and are um, in some sense facilitated um, to work together through common APIs and a common user interface. Uh, using you know normal software architecture uh, methods like um, pure plugins or pluginizable or extendable um, uh, user environments. Now Polkadot fits into this. Polkadot's one of the projects that the Web3 Foundation is stewarding, and Polkadot fits into this in so much as it is a platform to allow blockchains to communicate in a general and trust-free fashion. So. Um, there's no specific focus on any use cases like tokens. Um, rather, it's simply that um, blockchains can have bilateral um, communication channels um, and send whatever messages that they want to send between each other. And those messages can extend into things like um, KYC, identity mechanisms, reputation mechanisms, um, and uh, all sorts of other things that we probably haven't thought of yet. Um, Polkadot's um, sort of a, a funded project, and it's, it's, um, it's pushing forward with its development, and we do hope to get a uh, proof of concept out within the next few weeks. So that's quite interesting that uh, so many uh, emphasis on, on application services in this space with uh, uh, the view that uh, blockchain technology can really uh, provide uh, needed utility. Uh, maybe this would be a good time to ask uh, Julian, the uh, founder of Golem. Golem is one of the uh, oldest uh, projects in the uh, Ethereum space, actually, having presented at uh, the very first uh, Ethereum DevCon, in fact, uh, called uh, DevCon Zero, of course, because you have to start counting from zero, not, not from one. One is two. Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what is Golem and, and uh, you know, like who essentially uh, would would make use of Golem in the, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Sure. So yeah, uh, we 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 started thinking about Golem uh, very soon after learning uh, about Ethereum in late, late 2013, uh, uh, early early 2014. Uh, and and that was that there is actually quite a cool story connected to Gavin related to that like basically Gavin missed the meeting with us and and we started like thinking yeah well Ethereum like all the computer proof of work all the computers doing the same maybe you should do something to for the computers to do like different things like the ultimate charting <laughs> so uh, so so the idea emerged that that uh, we could just use the uh, untrusted uh, heterogeneous peer-to-peer -peer network to uh, distribute 
uh, arbitrary computing over that network to speed it up compared to one node. So you, you just use the 10 computers to do something you could do on one computer. Uh, and obviously that this is like, a, at least in the first step, useful mostly for a heavy uh, computing task, like a, like a MapReduce task that needs a lot of computing power. It can be uh, cut it into smaller pieces. Uh, so, so, and, and, and we also like very uh, soon figured out that even if we uh, thought that that proof of work is, is not necessarily uh, very efficient, that we will still need like a layer of, of consensus, like an external layer of consensus for the transactions, for the for the greater greater robustness of, of the of what we uh, uh, were planning, and, and it turned out that Ethereum is uh, definitely the, the platform to, to build on. So, so contrary, I think, to, to uh, projects, plans presented before, like we are like a, close, a little bit closer to the like, application level. Like Golem maybe is still like infrastructure level project in a way that we like, give access to computing, not necessarily like a social platform or, or a game. Um, uh, so ultimately, we are going to be platform for developers to build on and use computing power from 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 Golem, but but yet also like we are, uh, I would say that, clients to to Ethereum or users to Ethereum, like like the like first level users who like implement heavily what we are building on on Ethereum and in a smart contract system. But also Golem is like a 98 percent like rough estimate. Of, of, of the code of, of Golem is not related to, to, to smart contracts at all. But then, like, there's like this, this small piece that binds it all, and that lives on, 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 on Ethereum. Um, this is like long-term plan. And short-term, like, obviously, like, what, what we are launching soon is, is for a very specific group of users that are quite unexpected, I think. This is for CGI artists, because our first use case is CGI rendering which happens to like, need quite a lot of, of, of CPU or, or GPU cycles, and, and we are going to provide that with, with Golem to, to that group uh, as, as, as a way of like, taking off, showing that what we want to do is, is possible. But, but ultimately, we are also like, building the tool for, for developers, like a, a, a little bit higher in, in the stack that, that Gavin mentioned. So it's interesting so far that uh, in all of your responses uh, at this point, there has been such uh, a common theme of uh, you know, uh, community and uh, uh, running something together. I mean, this is, of course, the fundamental point of uh, what blockchains are. Um, blockchains are not just a computer science technology. Blockchains are a, a social coordination technology. Um, to that extent, uh, I have heard uh, that Golem has been described uh, sometimes as uh, Airbnb for computers. Yeah, so, but we are not, not the middleman. Yes, yes, understood, understood. Uh, the, 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 the no Airbnb needed coordination for providing Airbnb-like services, but not for uh, people to have a place to live, but for computers to have a job. Um, so I think this is uh, quite interesting, but one aspect of this coordination issue is uh, that there be some layer, uh, some aspect of economic incentivization uh, in order to keep the, the consensus, in order to keep the community uh, correctly aligned. So one question that comes again and again is for applications in the blockchain space, in the Ethereum space, uh, what, what, what economic incentive, what financial incentive is there? Uh, how to pay? And you know, obvious answer is to some extent, well, you, you pay with ETH. Uh, you know, it's the crypto fuel to power all these machines. But at the same time, many of these applications are targeted not just within the blockchain space, but actually very largely much beyond the blockchain space. There are you know, seven billion people on the planet approximately, and a couple billion uh, at least that have access to uh, computer technology, uh, things like uh, digital payments systems. But 
they are not necessarily holders of uh, crypto uh, uh, to tokens or, or currencies. So uh, this actually brings me to think about Maker. Uh, because uh, Maker, I understand, is what's called a stable coin project. Um, and uh, it is concerned with allowing people to access the blockchain space uh, with finance that they are more familiar with. Maybe uh, QJ, Shijun, can you please talk a little bit about Maker and how it relates to this kind of community orientation and uh, sure. so um, so for people who are not so familiar with MakerDAO or DAI, uh, the stable coin, I want to do a bit of an introduction. Um, MakerDAO has been the earliest, uh, one of the earliest uh, decentralized, decentralized autonomous organizations. And our goal is to remove the volatility of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ether so that uh, everybody can actually use. So in the case of your pocket money that you want to keep from your wives, if you want to put it in Bitcoin or Ether, you have to every now and then check whether the worth, the value is still there. In the case of DAI, uh, you don't need to worry about this because for now it's pegged to US dollar, which means you can use it the way you use Bitcoin, which is like everywhere um, these days on, on the internet. And also you don't need to worry about the storage of the value itself. So also in the case of the grants that we were given now that I think about it, we can actually give grants in DAI so that people don't need to really hire a fund management team to keep the value of the ETH uh, and worry about the rent and food that was mentioned here. Um, and the reason why this is closely related to everybody, uh, not only in a community of blockchain, Ethereum, uh, but also everybody else, is that the usage of a stable coin uh, would largely increase, like Thomas pointed out, um, the, the access to blockchain. At the same time, uh, this also brings us close to all the community members on blockchain and on Ethereum because everybody would want a stable coin so that um, the business that is being operated on Ethereum would have that mass adoption that normal businesses in real world would have. So that's basically the idea and the reason why we're very, very interested and very excited and honored to be one of the founding members of uh, Ethereum Community Fund. We want to bring that ties closer with every decentralized applications on Ethereum and in the Ethereum ecosystem. At the same time, to um, leverage everybody so that DAI can be more used by people who don't necessarily have that techie background to use cryptocurrencies. So this is something that I understand we have been uh, looking for, this type of solution in the cryptocurrency space for a while. So as, as Julian mentioned, um, very much of uh, the Golem project, uh, 98%, I think you said, of the yep, code? Roughly. Okay, okay. 97.6 so, of the code <laughs> is... Uh, it's changing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is uh, uh, not really uh, a blockchain or, or Ethereum related. Um, but at the same time, you introduce this small piece, which is, it, uh, it makes me think sometimes about how uh, very often the solution is almost there, but that one small piece more, just one well-placed move uh, can, can really change um, the way the outcome uh, happens. And it makes me think of like a board game, or like the game uh, Go, or uh, Wei Qi, uh, where where just one one move will will uh, change the entire layout of the space. When I think about uh, Dai or or the stablecoin concept, which uh, again is the uh, creation of a way to peg the value of uh, a crypto asset to uh, a real-world asset without having to rely on um, a, a central uh, trusted authority. Uh, I think about how uh, this is incredibly useful. This could very uh, radically change uh, how communities worldwide uh, will, will uh, use and, and access to resources. But one question comes to my mind when I think about stablecoins, which is uh, how are people able to get into these stablecoins 
And uh, the answer right now is, well, they have to have some other crypto asset. But Jun from Omisego, uh, I believe, has another piece which may make it more effective and able for people who are not in the crypto space at all to be able to access to DAI, to be able to use services like Golem and to be able to participate in entire ecosystems like uh, what Web3 or uh, Cosmos and Interchain are doing or the entire Ethereum and blockchain space itself. So maybe Jun, you can talk a little bit about uh, Omisego and the OMG network you are building and uh, how is it really so related to what Ethereum Community Fund is trying to accomplish? Okay. Um, so uh, in the fairness perspective, uh, I think I will do some Japanese <laughs> in here. Uh, and then uh, you guys, but most of you guys understand my Japanese too, right? Yeah, so I, I'm not really. <laughs> so also, also you, you guys know what we are doing. So, um, so I will do Japanese. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll speak in Japanese. So what Omisego is doing, um, our original concept is, uh, so we started uh, as Omise Payment, a payment provider, and so we found a lot of issues um, with the services uh, we provided, and so um, we became Omisego to, uh, to solve these issues. And so uh, we found Ethereum, um, which um, provided us with many of the solutions. And so um, without relying on the current uh, mainstream uh, payment systems, um, we were able to um, provide people with a payment system. <laughs> Maybe while we wait for everyone, you can explain why did you leave your skateboarding okay. career? So, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Round Omise. So, the, so, uh, the, uh, the, skateboard uh, the, the skateboard is a, one of like my iconic uh, the stuff. But at the same time, um, I really, really, you know, it's having the people in here. Um, it's this is like the phenomenal group of the Ethereum community supporter. And then I, I, I won at making some things a visible stuff. Um, and then like, that's why like I getting uh, all graph uh, from all the like funding member and who is contributing this. But actually I'm not, I haven't getting it everyone yet. So whoever uh, need to be signed here, <laughs> the later, oh uh, yes. So, so please sign. Uh, and then, yes, so that's the reason why um, I, I just want to present it here. Um, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we apologize for the skateboarding world for taking your uh, superstar ah. skater. Ah. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, okay. okay, so now we are ready to continue. Okay, so uh, um, what are you talking about? Um, in the Japanese way. So let, 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 me, let me come back. Um, uh, Okay. So while we were doing Omnise Payment and we wanted to develop uh, infrastructure that doesn't rely on financial institutions and uh, we wanted to have a network that people can exchange values, that is one of the reasons. What is the value I'm talking about? So, first of all, regal currency, there are regal currency and cryptocurrency, there are points, GM item, mileage, there are several things. All these things are variable. <laughs> that is why people keep these things, but they cannot have options about where to use it. So now in the internet became this popular and there are lots of ways people connect to the internet, but in terms of value exchange, they are not connected. Every time they go to different countries, they have to exchange currencies and they have to think about and foreign exchange rate as well. And what I thought is probably there's a way we will be able to do it in a more efficient way without any control. So that is what we wanted to make. This is a value exchanging layer based upon Ethereum. But there was another issue. So yesterday, 
not to call my Isayum no scaling issue. Vitalik talked about the scaling issue of Isayum. Vitalik said, how many transactions can be consumed? And he replied, 15 jugo in Japanese. So 15 transactions per second. Then you use a payment service every day. And is, it, is this capacity possible to handle all the transactions going on every day? In, at the moment, it's not possible. So all the people in the community are addressing this issue. And there's plasma developed by Vitalik and Joseph. It's architecture. And by using this, there's the scaling of OMG network. So this new solution is uh, under development. It's like a highway. And upon that, there's decentralized exchange. It's peer-to-peer -peer network for value exchange. But to connect these two layers, lots of lots of technologies is needed. And these two are, of course, um, under development. So However, if you can easily connect these, so that's why we are creating the third layer SDK. So by using this third layer SDK and copy and paste, then add function that you need, and it becomes easier to use all layers. So these are all open sourced. It's all public. Anyone can connect, like the internet. But all of these, all people here on the stage, what we are working on is now this is infrastructure layer and there are other services just like what you have in your smartphone. In order to create the services, we have to have a layer to provide sufficient functions. Of course, we already have the secured um, Ethereum and we have to scale this so that everyone can use this. And what is required to do so is then who will provide knowledge, who will develop this. So all of us gathered here, and there are people who are, there are members who are not on the stage as well, but as Wendell said, we provide fund, then they can buy time, and we provide knowledge, and they can leverage our knowledge. And by having more and more people into the community, we can develop the layer so that uh, we can create a wonderful world that everyone can use it on a daily basis. I'm done. I'm passing to you. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think that uh, this actually looked like kind of a comprehensive uh, picture for um, what the different projects uh, that are up here currently are, are trying to really bring to the space. And uh, as Jun mentioned uh, just now, um, the idea really is to uh, give in order that people who uh, receive may continue to give onwards. And with this kind of uh, ecosystem of uh, intelligent uh, giving, I understand that the initiative to not only focus on things which are strictly within the mandate of uh, the Ethereum Foundation's grant programs is, uh, is quite important to, to think about uh, possible ways to reach beyond and, and to welcome people who are coming in who are not necessarily already committed and, and knowledgeable. Uh, they are not necessarily committed to coming and working in Ethereum space because it is not reasonable to expect that people from outside of blockchain will have a clear enough understanding of the space to make highly informed choices about the parts of uh, ecosystem or blockchain communities that uh, they want to plug in. So my understanding is that Ethereum Community Fund is uh, really uh, strongly oriented not only to support the people who are working uh, tirelessly to to make 
the public infrastructure, which is useful for everyone, but uh, maybe don't necessarily already have the funding and uh, are not so interested, as uh, was mentioned in the earlier panel, to try to raise money um, from the public with a, a commercial project, like doing ICOs. Um, so there's the interest to support not just people in the community who are already having the idea to build really solid public infrastructure blockchain projects in Ethereum, but also people from outside who have their own bodies of knowledge and expertise, whether in you know, uh, doing various kinds of engineering or, or maybe even beyond the computer world, who want to come in and make something that is of value for everybody uh, in, in blockchain. Because Ethereum is not really a tribe. It is not really a, a collection of people that uh, only care about ourselves. But actually, my understanding is that it is a very welcoming and, and open and, and porous, so you know, like P-O-R-O-U-S, is this the right word, porous, uh, where the water can flow in and out, like through rocks. Uh, influences can come in and uh, influences can go out. And really there is such an emphasis on, on sharing and making uh, accessibility and availability for uh, people from outside the blockchain space uh, to come in. Maybe I can ask uh, all of you, what do you see is uh, uh, the advantage of, of growing the community to, to people who uh, want to join in order to uh, make a uh, valuable impact? Like what, what is really like the fundamental underlying, um, what do you say, like, like a benefit to, to doing this, to you know, not just growing beyond uh, Ethereum, with the community fund, but also uh, going beyond and welcoming from outside uh, people who are already native blockchain people. I can start. Um, so um, I guess the I think of the ECF and what the ECF will do as, as kind of like enriching the soil upon which all of us are growing projects. So imagine you've got land, and there are, you know, some a forest here and a forest there, and I feel like Ethereum is like a rainforest. And the reason why uh, is because uh, we all share knowledge and we learn from each other, uh, and we acknowledge um, the, the work that we've all done. And I think we all acknowledge that we we build upon each other's work. And so this allows all of us to benefit collectively. And um, uh, so I think of the ECF as a, as a uh, another thing is, actually, when I saw the, the, the grant winners here today uh, and, and what they were talking about, I was starting to realize what Wendell was talking about, which is that it's important to bring um, uh, the grant to projects, um, and, you know, not only to fund infrastructural things, common goods or uh, uh, projects, <coughs> Um, that would otherwise suffer from the tragedy of the commons, right? But but also to bring uh, new uh, talent and people together, and to, to for us to uh, continue uh, in engendering this culture of sharing and uh, collaborative uh, innovation. So uh, I would love to see the ECF uh, and, and 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 us together continue to uh, uh, carry that baton. I will start with the notion of um, uh, consensus. So the, the consensus is not only like a technical term, it is also a social term. And, and I believe that like uh, people working on Ethereum, contributing to Ethereum at the moment, like Ethereum community, uh, are people whose consensus is that this is the best technology to, to work with and, and build on. So, so, so like obviously like the, the, the community uh, on social level is, is the most important thing that you can have in a, in a decentralized space because uh, people like very very smart people are involved in that space and are building Ethereum and on Ethereum not because it has like the, the coolest branding around not because it has the, the biggest 
marketing budget or like the uh, anything else, but but because like the the consensus of of that community is that this is like a really really great technology, and this is like a self reinforcing loop. Like the the more smart people we have working on, com on, on, on Ethereum and the Ethereum ecosystem, like the better it becomes and the more people we can have and so on. And, 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 and I just think that as, as, as ECF, as a phenomena, is just the sign of the evolution of that community, which has grown uh, big enough and strong enough to, something, to start something which may evolve into some kind of I don't know, industry organization, which I maybe don't like that notion because it, like, uh, it, is like, um, it sounds like very like legacy uh, organization. But, but, but still, like, I, I think we, we need like, to experiment like, on, on the, on the, on the self-organizing ourselves, not only on technology level, but also on social level. Also because it is inevitable that we will have like, a different technologies built, built on Ethereum, like not necessarily like always glued together on a functional level, but still being the same technology or very close technologies um, uh, on, on, um, on a social level. And, uh, and, and, and also because of that, I think that this experimenting with the social level of cooperation is, 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 is very important. I don't know if that answers your question, but I wanted to uh, say just that. And also, I think that this uh, skating board comes from the Back to the Future because it doesn't have wheels, yeah. <laughs> which, which is the symbol of, of the of the meeting today. I hope. Um, so I guess Grant do have um, something, some overlap with um, community-oriented um, funds in general um, that might be for profit. I think, um, I think one of the advantages or one of the niches that grants fulfill well um, are those um, where the people um, that would like to do the work might be brilliant but might also not want to have quite the level of commitment up front that other um, sort of more profit driven um, um, ways of taking money uh, would require. Um, those people who maybe want to, they, they love what they're doing, but they also love their job, and they would like a little extra support, maybe they would like to get some extra infrastructure, maybe they'd like to um, have a friend work on it with them. And these more modest, um, but largely unconditional um, uh, grants of funding, I think, can do um, you know, a, very, um, a very significant amount of impact for the good. Um, where other forms of funding would would not. On top of that, of course, there are there are inevitably sort of other grant programs, the Ethereum Foundations, to, to name a very notable one. Um, and I think, you know, aside from the fact that you know, obviously there is overlap, but, but aside from the fact that there is um, perhaps a broader um, scope for uh, the ECF, I think it's also um, it can't sort of be expressed enough that um, having uh, just, just different sources and different decision makers helps make the ecosystem in general more robust. So, uh, <laughs> as I, I, you know, as I, as the three of you guys uh, done it really well, uh, and uh, I don't have to say much, but. Uh, uh, I really love, you know, it's the J, as mentioned, the rainforest. Um, that illustration, you know, it's to represent um, this Ethereum community. And but, you know, the, the rainforest is not just trees, but so many creatures can live in it. So we are most welcome to having um, the beyond, you know, our, the Ethereum ideas. And then um, also, uh, but it's, there is like good soil, so I really want uh, the people to understand what's going on in the rainforest. And then that's some things that we can really help, you know, it's other than just funding them. Because um, in the recently, uh, situations has been changed um, because of like some um, ICO stuff. But um, the importance is understanding 
increasing knowledge base and then utilizing the tools a proper way. So that's a, the, the something maybe a, is number one, the benefit from this uh, Ethereum community fund. So I, I re really, really encourage the people to participate in this uh, community. Um, it, it's my understanding that um, whole humankind suffers from uh, this awareness of objectivity, objectivity, like whether we, what we see is real, what we experience is real, and it's even more so in cryptocurrency, in blockchain, in this very virtual world. Um, I guess that guy who used 4,000 4, Bitcoin to, 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 to try to buy a pizza, who is biting his tongue now, but was trying to verify whether this crazy idea about money on internet would really be real and will, that be, will there be another crazy person that would agree to this idea. I guess up, um, upon all these very, very important and practical points, what I want to point out is that uh, this community fund would prove to the world um, out there that we are really here in our flesh and we're really here to help everybody who wants to be more involved and want to know about what Ethereum and cryptocurrencies and blockchain can do to real life. And um, so that would just not be just sort of a delusion that some people, some group of people have. And we are giving out real money to help you realize and help you get started. And that's my input. So that's quite interesting, and it also uh, touches upon a point that uh, Gav made uh, about how grants uh, have a, a kind of a specific uh, utility, and maybe it is not necessarily comprehensive, but uh, that grants uh, can play a very important role. And uh, what uh, Jun said about uh, how you know this is not just uh, giving uh, money, but uh, it is also uh, giving knowledge. I wonder if uh, there might be any consideration. When we think about uh, uh, projects which you know, have economic incentivization built in that are uh, necessarily to an extent uh, uh, commercial, not necessarily in spirit, but, but in form, there has to be some kind of transactional, uh, uh, sustainable uh, component to, to many of the, the projects that are here. In fact, I would say uh, all of the, the projects which are here. Um, someone somewhere uh, uh, is uh, able to help the whole ecosystem by someone somewhere making a profit. So how can grants maybe fit into that? Is there any consideration that the, the uh, grant recipients can um, themselves uh, become commercial projects or, you know, uh, because otherwise we are looking at this as very, very like pure uh, non-profit and, uh, uh, you know, where, where the, the giving is uh, for, for giving forward only. That is, of course, a very important and valuable part of uh, building the public infrastructure that I think everyone here is uh, involved with. But is there also the possibility, and, and if so, what does it look like for uh, profitable uh, engagement for uh, grant recipients? Either can the grant projects uh, that receive the grant themselves uh, become commercial, or can their activity uh, uh, somehow stimulate something that is more directly commercial or, or profitable? And, and you know this this kind of starts to take the form of like uh, impact investment in some ways. Can people talk a little bit uh, about that? We have not so much time left, but I think it's uh, quite an important topic, maybe to to touch on. Well, um, regarding impact investment, um, you know, I'll just give an example with a particular um, thing that I would love the ECF to to help fund in the future, which is. Uh, it's about open hardware. Um, and so, uh, of course, open source is eating the software world, and, and we're all generally creating open source software. But uh, one thing that is concerning uh, from an ecosystem point of view is 
I feel like we don't have enough trustable uh, computing uh, devices. Uh, of course, there are many uh, companies today uh, that, that provide hardware uh, wallet solutions, and thank God for them. But, um, but I also feel like we need uh, something that is completely open with no proprietary components uh, in order to truly have security uh, because, you know, for, for the same reasons why open source is more secure than closed source and, and you know, for, this, for the reason why, um, you know, I, I just, maybe I'm just paranoid, but I, I don't want to trust, you know, a closed source proprietary hardware solutions. So I want to be able to inspect it with a microscope and see that it's actually the circuitry that it should be. Um, so, um, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> this is the context, but... Uh, that was a very interesting point, and uh, uh, probably uh, it came to your mind because uh, with something like uh, hardware uh, manufacturing and design and uh, uh, processes, uh, it is very, very expensive and very uh, involved, and so their you know, commercial aspect is really uh, useful for that. But is there... Is there another uh, perspective? Uh, maybe Jun, you, you were saying, what, uh, what are the potentials for uh, uh, commercial involvement and, and profitable outcomes uh, that Ethereum Community Fund can maybe enable, even if uh, it is not necessarily directly for the uh, fund, you know, founding members or something, uh, but, but other people who, who come in who want to contribute, but they have this thought, well, we don't have so much money, and we are not so experienced with the space, uh, how can I feel that by doing good for the entire ecosystem, and the entire community of people who will use this public resource, how can I also justify my contribution in that I can, you know, recover the, the money that I put in or, or maybe make a profit even? Yeah, uh, I guess <laughs> in the examples of these projects that relatively have bigger pocket of Ether uh, because uh, we've been there for a very long time and uh, been contributing to the Ethereum uh, ecosystem and so that we are much well funded, uh, much better funded than all the other projects that just started. And because of this initiative, we are able to put together some money to start this grant. And in the future, when other projects are getting more profitable themselves, uh, we encourage them. And I hope that would actually happen to become the members uh, in this uh, Ethereum community fund. And we promise this will be a very, very flat um, structure of deciding which projects to give grants to and to, to help so that in the future this is not just merely by a few projects but by the whole ecosystem a great funding into the next generations of um, important and great projects. That's my so I, I think there are um, sort of two interesting points here. Um, one is that um, simply by virtue of being relatively low commitment grants, it can help bring aboard people into the potential, let's say, outside investment um, framework that would otherwise uh, not, be, uh, not be willing to enter themselves. And I'm thinking here people, um, if I go back to the uh, point before, um, that may have very good jobs, maybe they have um, you know, a two or 300K Silicon Valley job or bank job, they're very interested in Ethereum or the community, they have a very good idea, but it's simply not in their interest to, to leave that on, you know, to, to go pursue their idea. Um, a grant can really provide that bridge um, to, the, uh, to the point where it is possible for external investors to actually place something more like an equity investment with some um, uh, uh, you know, greater likelihood that money will be made in the end. The, uh, and the second point that follow on to that is, of course, that the ECF uh, being as a uh, sort of onboarding almost um, uh, position is one that is likely to have a much greater um, ability to um, uh, create lasting relationships with such um, not quite yet entrepreneurs. 
and um, obviously um, as uh, uh, people as, uh, that would be part of a decision-making process, um, uh, those people would share in that relationship. If I just may add to that, I believe that money is out there, like getting money is not that complicated, so I think that the ECF like, uh, can compete with the round of introductions from, from, from brand manager Wendell uh, to start with, which is like a great competitive advantage, I think, like for anyone willing to build in that space, and prospectively, possibly on other fields, like with the onboarding, as Gav said, I think this is like the, the critical. And we also because of that, we, we should be a bit too picky with the, with the grants, like, so, so I wouldn't rule out like uh, for profit endeavors, like just for the sake of, of bringing them to, to the ecosystem. But on the other hand, like probably like the, 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 the non-profit should have some kind of priority. So uh, is, you know, is this something that like uh, anyone and, and everyone can join and become a member and contribute to? I think, Jun, you were, uh, you were going to raise the microphone just now. What were you saying? Uh, you know, Nihongo uh, desu. I'm... Actually, you know, it's, uh, everyone's like uh, represent as a what I want to say. So it's uh, I don't have anything, uh, and unfortunately, it's, it seems like we're time out. <laughs> yep. We are over time, <laughs> but uh, I really, really admire uh, all the perspectives that uh, you shared today. So uh, yes, thank you very much from uh, the community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arigato. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give them another round of applause to the panelists. Also, thank you very much for our audience for listening. Thank you very much. And lastly, we will have a closing word from the founder and CEO of Global Brain, Mr. Yasuhiko Yurimoto. <laughs> so I'm, I feel a bit nervous today. If I talk to people in the same industry, I'm not nervous, but today is a bit different, so I might say something weird. But uh, now time is already, uh, we are already behind the schedule. I will make it short. short. First of all, thank you very much for coming today during your busy schedule on the very end of the physical year. So today we have about 100 guests from outside Japan, so this event has global attention. Today is a launch event of ECF. We had event yesterday as well, so it's about the Ethereum blockchain ecosystem development. The project is to contribute the further development of ecosystem. I'm from venture capital in Japan, so we have the supporters, and we are the only one venture capital from Japan to take part in this project. And as a venture capitalist, the purpose of this system and how to collaborate with uh, big companies in Japan, I would like to touch up on these points. First of all, we, Global Brain, is a venture capital. So, actually, from three and a half years ago, we started investment to blockchain venture companies. So, we have been in, making investment to UK, Singapore, and Japanese companies. So, and uh, I meet more than 100 blockchain startups, and uh, I connect them to Japanese companies as necessary. Sorry, but the technology is still developing, especially in Japanese blockchain startup companies. Their technology is still developing. So in order to make more enhancement to these uh, companies, the information exchange from top learners just like we had today, and also <coughs> the promotion <coughs> of the application to industry, we have to create this really strong ecosystem. That is what we have to do. So we have a knowledge uh, regarding VC, so we have the network. So 
we can connect community and industry and we also have we also have to increase the use case of blockchain as well so we would like to make our contribution to the point yesterday we had road show and uh, we introduced new torino the co-working space of, of blockchain and also this is the very big step as well. And in order to contribute ECF, we created Global Blame Blockchain Level, our subsidiary company. So this is uh, in order to create a use case, we connect big companies and startup companies. That is a focus. So blockchain is needless to say, it's developing, but this is such a huge innovation. And this innovation is not belong to any one particular individual it's all of us can contribute it's global phenomena so ECF in order to develop this not only entrepreneurs but researchers and research institutions and people from huge companies we would like to have all of these people and for the future projects and researches ECF will be platforms for these to corroborate and communicate for the top global project, this is going to be the platform, and this also will be the contact point for Japanese uh, companies as well. And we would like to have more closer, close relationship with Japanese company to have even stronger ecosystem. So I really appreciate your active involvement and not lastly, I would like you to think about the meaning. We have this launch event in Japan. It's not Singapore, it's not the US, it's not Switzerland. It's happening in Japan, and we have Bitalik, and we have top founders outside from outside of Japan. I would like you to think about this meaning, and in order to have the same event next year, we all would like to work on together. Thank you very much today. Thank you very much, Mr. Yurimut. And this concludes the Ethereum Community Fund announcement event. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And before you leave, please uh, return your receiver to the reception desk before you leave, please. So once again, thank you very much. Um, take, please take your all belongings with you and take care back to your home. Thank you very much.